His cold smile never left his face as the officers swarmed inside, but inwardly, he must have felt the icy tendrils of stark realization. After continuously mocking and outmaneuvering the law, his vile secret was finally blown open. The hunt for one of Britain's most wanted men had come to a surprising conclusion in the quiet streets of Sutton-on-Trent. As he was manhandled into a squad car, who could have predicted the shockingly ordinary origins of such an extraordinarily wicked human being? Born to a working-class family in Cayley in 1941, young Michael seemed to follow a conventional enough path at first. He joined the Merchant Navy at 20, got married and started a family, ran his own engineering business for a time. In fact, he was married three times and had two sons from his first wife. But something inside Sam's had gone rancid long ago. By middle age, his life had evolved into an undertow of divorce, crime, and imprisonment on charges like insurance fraud. A nightmarish cancer diagnosis cost him a leg, only fueling his increasingly virulent bitterness toward the world. Always looking for get-rich-quick schemes, Sam's found a new despicable calling, using fear and violence as tools of extortion. His sadistic ploys and breathtaking audacity in evading capture would soon make him front-page news across Britain. It all began on a seemingly ordinary Friday, July 12, 1991, when a man in Leeds received a bizarre, unexpected letter from his girlfriend asking to be saved since she was kidnapped and being held like a personal security. It said that she would be captive until next Monday night and that he should inform her mother about the situation immediately. She also addressed her mom in this letter, asking her to go to the police straight away to rescue her. She mentioned how she was not eating anything but was offered some food. She also wrote about how sick she was feeling and that she had only been drinking two cups of tea every day. Dominic was completely dumbfounded. He didn't understand why someone would send a ransom demand and not even ask for any money. I couldn't understand the letter. It didn't, didn't make sense. Oh, we'd kidnap Julie and I'd want her for ransom. Because I thought I'd have got a letter saying I want so many thousands of pounds. It just didn't make sense. Her mother also couldn't believe it. According to her, the letter that was received was not written in the handwriting of Julie's. And even the way the phrases were used was hard for her mother to believe that it was actually Julie. She would never use the words personal security. It was all wrong. However, as soon as Dominic showed the disturbing letter to Julie's frantic mother, she immediately contacted the police to report her daughter missing. A massive search operation kicked into high gear, with Julie's loved ones driving all around Leeds, desperately showing her photo to anyone they encountered. They went to pubs, shops, you name it. They just went around asking everyone if they knew who Julie was and if they had seen her around. But unfortunately, no one knew where she was. No one had seen her for days. I went everywhere looking for her. Must have covered leads, I don't know how many times. You know, that night we'd go in pubs again. I even had any photographs. I was saying, have you seen Julie Dart? Do you know Julie Dart? And people say, oh yeah, I know Julie. Have you seen her? No, we haven't seen her for about a week. Little did they know, that very same day, a letter had arrived at the Leeds City Police Headquarters, making a chilling claim that a prostitute had been kidnapped from the Chapeltown area and would be murdered if a 140,000 pound ransom wasn't paid by the following Monday night. The letter also threatened to firebomb a city center store if the demands weren't met. Even though the vice squad's turf was mentioned, the odd letter was brushed off at first as a hoax. But then Julie's letter also arrived at the station and suddenly, two seemingly unrelated cases became chillingly intertwined. While Julie wasn't known to Vice, witnesses had spotted her working Chapel Town's red light district. The letters created an inescapable link between her disappearance and the disturbing ransom threat. At that point, they realized that the letters they received needed to be taken seriously at any cost. They were dealing with a kidnapper and possibly 
even a killer. What happened next set off one of the biggest manhunts and most elaborate sting operations in British criminal history. As police pulled out all the stops to try and beat the sick psychopath at his own twisted game, his first victim barely registered as a human to Sam's at all. In July 1991, he lured 18-year-old sex worker Julie Dart from the streets of Leeds into a trapped vehicle. He blindfolded her and took her to a place where he bound her hand and foot and imprisoned the terrified young woman in a coffin-like box inside his grim workshop lair, leaving her chained to the floor. When Dart bravely attempted to escape, Sam showed no mercy despite her desperate pleas. He bludgeoned her to death with a hammer before callously dumping her body in a field near the railway track days later. All a part of his twisted practice run, Sam's mused for more elaborate money-making kidnapping schemes to come. But his treatment of the next captive victim, a state agent, Stephanie Slater, would etch his name among Britain's most notorious criminals of all time. Duping Slater with an elaborate ruse about viewing a property, Sam's pounced without warning that January day in 1992. He shoved the bound, gagged, and blindfolded woman into his car trunk and sped off to his warehouse, intent on adding torture to his barbaric repertoire. For over a week, the 25-year-old was held handcuffed, bound, gagged, and blindfolded inside a makeshift coffin in Sam's hellish lair. Delirious with fear, she wondered if the psychopath's threats to electrocute her for any movement were real. When allowed out briefly for meager rations, Slater instinctively tried to humanize herself to her deranged captor, chatting and charming him in hopes of survival. Sam's had even essayed his victim. Yet even after enduring such devastating trauma, Slater's resilience and courage shone through. She ultimately persuaded Sam's to accept a 175,000-pound ransom for her freedom. He had extorted her frantic employer for Stephanie's safe return. Kevin Watts, the boss of the kidnapped estate agent Stephanie Slater, received a disturbing phone call with instructions on where he was to deliver the ransom payment. It was like something out of a movie. Who's this, please? Never mind. Have you got the money? For tomorrow? For tomorrow? Yeah. Have you got it? I'm getting it, yeah. First, he was directed to a phone booth inside the Glossop train station, where he got new orders to go to another phone booth down the road, about 200 feet away. At that second location, there was a written note telling him to proceed to yet another phone booth. By the time he reached the third one, a heavy fog had rolled in and it was getting late. An eerie, isolated setting. The new note instructed him that this roundabout route was to confirm he wasn't being followed. From there, Kevin was sent further into isolation, driving down a secluded, brittle path until he spotted a shipway sign on a wooden stake. He followed the sign until he reached a cone in his path. Attached to the cone was a note directing him to take the bag left there, put the ransom money inside, and keep driving. As he continued, there was another cone with instructions that he had 60 seconds to place the bag of money on the wooden tray on a nearby wall, then immediately drive away. The money would only be collected after he left. Those crucial minutes must have been agonizingly tense for Kevin Watts as he carefully followed every step, not knowing if he'd see Stephanie alive again. Based on the criminal's own confession later, he had meticulously planned the ransom movement from a hidden vantage point to avoid any police surveillance, a calculated, chilling operation. Weeks earlier, he had closely studied the abandoned railway cutting in Barnsley, learning the layout, where people could see, and ways to escape. In one smooth motion, Sam's pulled on the rope tied to the wooden tray and brought the bag of money tumbling down to his feet. He quickly stuffed the money into his backpack and slid down a narrow tunnel that he had dug out earlier, leading to some bushes where his moped was waiting. Revving the engine, he sped into the thick fog, holding tightly to the ransom money he had worked so hard for, fooling over 1,000 police officers in his cat-and-mouse game. According to detectives, 
The only reason he was able to get away was because it was a foggy night and they had lost radio control over Slater's boss. Everything had been going well until we had the technical breakdown with the microphone. We lost Kevin for a short period of a crucial time. When we found him again, we realized the money had been dropped. I think at that particular time, knowing the money had been dropped, thinking that the kidnapper had then probably escaped, and the realization that we still didn't know whether Stephanie was, uh, was gonna be released was safe. Flushed with his perceived flawless victory, Sam's had no idea that a string of seemingly minor mistakes had already planted the seeds of his undoing. From the distinctive spelling errors in his rambling ransom notes to the unusual materials used in his victim's bondage, a damning trail of forensic evidence was leading investigators directly to his doorstep. Most crucially, a recording of Sam's voice played on live television was immediately recognized by an eagle-eared former spouse, his first wife, Susan. Just like that, a callous off-handed remark cracked open the biggest manhunt in recent British history. I was convinced it couldn't be him, but decided to video the program so that when I came home on Thursday evening, I could listen to the voice and put it out of my mind completely. I want to speak to Kevin Watts quickly, please. She was calling. Never mind. Then he said, never mind. <sighs> Even now, I think about it, I go cold. Within days, the arrogantly overconfident criminal found his suburban facade shattered. Taken into custody, the smirking Sams had no idea that investigators already possessed stunning secretly recorded admissions of his guilt from his own lips. In chilling detail, he had revealed the specific day Julie Dart met her horrific end, stating his remorseless motive was simply to end the torment of her grieving mother. But Sam's was just beginning his own private torment, one of rotting away for decades in Britain's most brutal prisons as justice for his depravity. He continued lashing out with disturbing violence even during incarceration, attacking a female guard with a metal spike in a rage in 1995. Well, despite his obvious malice towards humanity, Sam's tried to portray himself as a victim too at times. He infamously sued the prison system when officials lost his prosthetic leg, winning thousands in damages that outraged the public. He claimed prisoners like himself were treated better than OAPs in the community. He also later tried to sue the prison again, only because this time his bed was too hard. But Michael Sam's true penance could only be served through the life sentence of knowing his evil manipulation games had finally met their fatal match. Thanks to a combination of blind chance, determined policing, and the bravery of one surviving victim's harrowing testimony, one of Britain's most twisted criminal minds was no longer a free man. As the courtroom fell into hushed stillness, while the jury foreman pronounced the word guilty for Sam's litany of horrific crimes. Any fleeting delusions of grandeur may have instantly evaporated. The 52-year-old was now cast into a permanent shadow of being branded a sadistic murderer, extortionist without any hope of release. Only one person in the room that fateful day could truly comprehend the finality of justice being served. The woman who lived to tell the tale of Michael Sam's sick, twisted games. As he was led away, perhaps Stephanie Slater allowed herself the smallest sigh of relief that her unspeakable nightmare had finally found its epilogue. The notoriously cunning criminal had been caught red-handed by the courage and resilience of his would-be victim herself. For in the end, Michael Sam's undoing was catalyzed by the one person whose life he did not take.